Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Cucumber Green Model Mosaic Virus webinar. My name is Leonie Martin, and I'm a Plant Biosecurity Officer with New South Wales DPI, and I will be your host for this event this morning. So thank you very much for jumping online with us to give us an hour of your time this morning. So before we start, we're just going to run into some webinar housekeeping that I will run through. <clears throat> if we could just change the slide. Thank you. That would be wonderful. So some of the uh, housekeeping this morning, will everyone will be on mute for the duration of the webinar this morning. However, you can type a question into the um, items box on the right hand side of your screen. We have two presenters this morning and that will be followed by a short Q&A session at the end. Not all questions may be answered due to time constraints, but we will do our very best. Um, and the webinar should only run for no, no longer than 11.30 this morning. So we're, we're hoping to keep it within the hour. Um, the webinar and the Q&A sessions will all be recorded this morning. So if we don't get to answer one of your questions, um, it will be included in the recorded session up on our DPI website. So to jump in, no further ado, we have two presenters. So a quick introduction to these two people is Shannon Mulholland, who you can see on the screen is a plant pathologist with the Plant Biosecurity Research and Diagnostic Team. Shannon is based on the central coast of Rimba and has worked in the vegetable industry for several years on a range of pathology issues. Her current research focus is investigating viruses affecting curcubit production in areas around New South Wales and validating potential new viral management options. Our second speaker this morning is Andrew Daly. He's a plant pathologist with 15 plus years experience in diagnostic biosecurity and research pathology, and he's currently working in the Plant Health Diagnostic Service. This service is NASA and DAWE accredited to provide a quality and biosecure plant pathology disease diagnostics. And the primary functions of that is to assist industry with endemic disease management facilitate interstate and international trade by providing planting material certification and assist New South Wales and other jurisdictions in managing biosecurity responses. So between these two people, they have a huge wealth of knowledge, some of which they're going to share with you this morning. So Shannon, with no more for Shannon, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Leone. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for donating a little bit of your time this morning to come and join with us to talk about cucumber green model mosaic. Virus. I want to run through a few different aspects of this disease, including a bit of background about what it actually is. We'll jump into some detail about where we're finding it in Australia, and then we'll move on to some of the biosecurity management strategies that we have. So cucumber green model mosaic virus is quite a mouthful. So from here on in, we'll just refer to it as CGMMV. It is a member of the Tabamo virus family, which for those of you playing at home on pub trivia, it's also the same family as tobacco mosaic virus, which was the first virus ever to be discovered by science. It was first discovered in the mid 1930s in England and has since spread to around about 40 countries right around the world. It needs a living host to replicate as do most of the other plant viruses, but this one is a little bit different as it can survive for long periods in dead plant material and in soil and water which makes it significantly more challenging to try and manage this once it actually makes it on farm. <clears throat> CGMMV is a newly detected viral pathogen for New South Wales. However, growers are already facing virus management issues within their cropping cycles. Uh, two of the most common viruses we come across are papaya ring spot virus and watermelon mosaic virus. These are members of the potyvirus family and they're very widespread throughout the production regions of New South Wales. Uh, there used to be quite a bit of zucchini yellow mosaic virus in New South Wales as well, but interestingly, we haven't actually been picking this up in recent surveys. So uh, it's a little bit of a mystery as to why it suddenly declined in its um, incidence. However, this is a very common virus elsewhere in Australia. We also have some fairly widespread infections of cucumber mosaic virus. This particular virus has a very large host range, so we find it in a lot of different crops and weeds and ornamentals. It's, it's a bit of a common cold virus for the vegetable industry. We do occasionally pick up some periodic detections of melon necrotic spot virus and beet pseudos yellow virus, but these are usually less of an issue for the widespread production areas of New South Wales. CGMMV can be transmitted in a number of different ways. Um, it is a seed-borne infection, so it can come in in seed, uh, which makes it a little bit challenging to really try and prevent it making it to farm at all because you need plants at some point for your production system. 
The main way that it's spread once it actually makes it onto a farm is through infected sap. This virus is very easily mechanically transmitted. You can uh, break the surface of the leaf or a stem or the fruit and just get infected sap on your hands or on your work tools, on your car tyres, tractors, packing equipment. Um, it's very easily spread and it can move through a crop very rapidly. It can also persist in plant debris um, even after the plant has died and that also brings us down to the soil transmission. It can persist in the soil for more than a year. Uh, different reports from different parts of the world suggest anywhere from a few months to two or three years. Uh, but a lot of this could be associated with the plant debris being in the soil. So something to be mindful of. If you have a crop that's infected and that crop is then um, ploughed in or it dies, and you have leaf, stem, and particularly root material in the soil that is infected, uh, it can actually let the virus stay viable in there for quite some time. Although it is dependent on the environmental conditions at the time as well. Uh, it can also be transmitted in water. If you have a one-way irrigation system through your farm and you start with a clean input, the risk of this is much lower. However, if you have a recirculated water system or a hydroponic system, particularly in greenhouses, this becomes much more problematic. If there isn't adequate disinfection and filtering systems of your water source, you could potentially be flushing the virus back through the crop again and again and again. Oh, sorry, just one more thing before we click on to the next slide. Uh, CGMV has no known insect vectors. Most of the other viruses that we mentioned earlier are transmitted by a range of different insects, particularly aphids. There's no known insect vectors for CGMMV. However, because it can be transmitted in pollen, there has been um, a little bit of implication of honeybees accidentally moving uh, infected pollen around on a local scale. Uh, CGMMV has been detected in hives and we're just trying to verify whether that's actually viable virus or just um, dead virus that's still inside the hive. Uh, and that's something that the Northern Territory researchers are working on quite furiously at the moment. So hopefully we can have a little bit more information about that soon. Host range for CGMV through the cucurbit family is quite broad. It can basically infect pretty much all of the main cucurbit crops that we grow in Australia. It can also infect cucurbit weeds such as paddy melon. Uh, and it's something to be mindful of too, as we have emerging markets starting to develop in Australia, things like bitter gourd, they can also be infected by the endemic viruses that we have and also by CGMV. There's also a number of weed species that can host CGMV. And it's certainly something very important to include in any screening or management programs for this particular disease, as they could uh, be hosting the virus right around and throughout the crops as well. Amaranth species, there's quite a few of them that can host CGMMV. You've also have crowfoot grass, caltrop, wild gooseberry, and the last two, blackberry nightshade and fortulaca or purslane. They are two of the most common weeds that I've come across through cucurbit farms. Uh, so they would be two that I would be targeting for weed management and also including in your surveillance operations as well. General virus symptoms can be tricky to identify in the field. The image I've got up on the screen there shows a range of symptoms from different viruses in cucurbits and there's generally a lot of overlap. You can generally recognise that it is a virus from plant symptoms in the field, but trying to work out exactly which virus you have can be very, very difficult, even for trained virologists. Uh, you really need laboratory diagnosis to confirm which virus you're handling. Uh, the severity can also depend on the crop species, the variety being grown, the environmental conditions, and even the age of the crop. And it's something that we do see with CGMMV is that particularly in field-grown melons, symptoms can actually come and go. It's not so much that the plant has recovered and the virus is gone, it's just part of the life cycle of the virus where the symptoms are stronger at some points and then weaker at other times. Frustratingly, symptoms can also just be non-existent uh, and this is quite common for some of the weed hosts. Uh, they can be asymptomatic hosts, so they can still have very healthy viable populations of virus churning along inside them, but they actually just don't show any symptoms whatsoever. So if you are sampling for viruses in a crop, it's very important to include symptoms and asymptomatic plants in your sampling as well. And that kind of broadens your net to try and capture anything that may just not be developing symptoms just yet, particularly if it's also a young infection in the plant. 
Uh, I've got a couple of uh, common symptoms for CGMV on this slide, but I'll delve into the cucumber and watermelon symptoms in more detail in just a moment. Uh, but you tend to get uh, leaf model and mosaic symptoms in leaves. You can get crinkled new growth and you can get lumpy and discoloured fruit. A common thing that we find with CGMV is you can get early fruit abortion, which also has a direct impact on reducing yield. And as I mentioned before, the symptoms can come and go. So it is important to keep looking throughout the crop, depending on the age of the crop, uh, because you may need to catch it at a particular time. With cucumber, the most common symptoms you'll come across will be the leaf mottle and the leaf mosaic. You can also see stunted growth in the plants and you can get a wide variety of symptoms even within the one crop. The images on this particular slide, they're actually all photos taken for one crop in one greenhouse infected with CGMMV. And you can see that there's quite a broad range of different symptoms coming through. One of the most common symptoms I've found in the greenhouse um, system in Australia is the image on the bottom row, second in from the left. You see it has quite a dark centre and then it fades to a lighter green around the edge and almost a yellow tinge around the leaf margin found that quite a few times for CGMMV infection. It's not as clear in the photo, but in the greenhouse it stands out very, very strongly. So it's something to keep an eye out for. You can also get uh, mottle and deformation of the fruit. Now the two images that I've got on this particular slide are very extreme examples of that. Sometimes the model and the deformities can be very, very subtle and you're really left questioning, is this a symptom or is this just a particular fruit that's a little bit wonky? Um, you can also get fruit with no symptoms whatsoever. Uh, you can see in the centre image there that the plant looks quite wilted, it's a bit stunted. It's quite obviously different from either plant on either side of it. And that's another common symptom I've seen in greenhouse infections, is the plant seem to go downhill very, very quickly. And in the image on the top right hand corner, that's a good example of the leaf model that's very common with the CGM and B symptoms in cucumber. Watermelon, the symptoms can be a little bit more subtle and you're also working with a much smaller leaf surface area than what you have for cucumbers. However, they do have the same range of symptoms. Uh, you can get the leaf mottle and mosaic, you can get blistering and leaf crinkling. And as you can see in the top image, the, the leaves, they can just be a little bit smaller. It is a difficult thing to try and identify in the field because you also have variety differences that can cause bubbling and crinkling just as part of the normal growth of the plant. Uh, and sometimes these symptoms can be very subtle, as you can see in the top photos, and sometimes they can be very extreme, as you can see in the bottom image. And you can get a range of symptoms within a crop as well. With the fruit of watermelon, uh, it can range from anywhere from no symptoms whatsoever and looking perfectly fine on the outside, uh, although the inside can be quite a different story right through to very obvious ring spots and mottling on the rind or lumpy deformities across the fruit. What we find when we cut into infected fruit is there's often uneven ripening and you can get this discoloration and spongy flesh as well, which just the fruit just does not look right. Um, I've had reports from growers as well claiming that the, the fruit taps hollow as well, so that's something that you can have a look for in the field. And you can also find necrotic lesions on the stem and the peduncle. It's a little bit difficult to see in these images because they're quite small, but the necrotic lesions are basically brown, dead looking bits of tissue right around where the stem joins into the fruit or a few inches back on the stem. And that can be quite a common symptom of CGMMV, even if the rest of the crop doesn't look terribly bad, or there might be just a slight colour issue with the leaves, um, having a look for the necrotic lesions is another really good symptom to keep an eye out for. All right, so Australia, where are we up to with this particular infection and how does it impact on New South Wales? CGMMV was first picked up in field grown watermelons in 2014 in the Northern Territory. Um, a full on biosecurity response was launched at that point because that was the first detection of this virus in Australia. Once they started to do the delimiting surveys around the initial farm, they realised that the infection was quite widespread, indicating that it's probably been there for a little while. And so we shifted from an eradication response to a management response. This is aimed at managing the infection in the field as best as possible, but also containing the infection as much as possible so that it didn't spread to other regions. Unfortunately, as the disease often do, they do spread. 
despite your best efforts, and it was found again in 2015 in Queensland, also in field grown watermelon. In 2016, it was picked up in Western Australia in a few cucumber greenhouses, and I believe also in one field grown watermelon property. And then it was detected again in Queensland in 2017, this time in cucumber. In 2019, we had our first detection in New South Wales in a cucumber greenhouse. Uh, we were hoping that was an isolated incidence and we had good containment around that particular property and that grower has worked very hard on um, eradication efforts uh, with quite a great deal of success. Uh, but unfortunately, we've had another range of detections pop up just in the last couple of months in New South Wales. There's also been a detection in South Australia in Cucumber late last year as well. The recent detections in New South Wales, we've had a couple of properties filled grown watermelons down around the Victorian border and we've had another one in the Sydney Basin in protected cropping in cucumber. We've done quite a bit of work trying to understand where this infection is coming from. Now that we have multiple properties affected, these properties have no known linkages and we have multiple crops, varieties and seed companies um, are being affected. The difficulty we're tracing back for these kinds of outbreaks is we hit roadblocks with the information. So we're still working on trying to identify the source so that we can improve the biosecurity systems in place there. But at the moment, I can't give you an answer as to where it's actually coming from. Um, I'm also in the process of doing some genetic analysis on the samples that we've collected from New South Wales, because that'll help us understand if it's linked to any of the other Australian populations. Uh, and that'll give us some good information moving forward for management as well. We have a few systems in place already for managing CGMV within Australia. After the Northern Territory detection happened and we started to shift from eradication to management, as it was deemed not te technically feasible to eradicate, particularly from field grown melons, um, there was the development of the National CGMV Management Plan. So this gives a platform and a strategy for the entire country to work together on a one cohesive plan. This is actually available for download online for free if anyone's interested in reading it. It's quite a hefty document, but there's some really good information in there. CGMV is no longer covered under the Emergency Plant Pest Response Deed. This deed covers um, particularly important incursions into Australia and basically arranges a cost sharing arrangement right across industry and across country to manage the infection as it arrives. Once it shifts out of that ability to be eradicated and everyone's working together to get rid of it from the whole country, um, it steps back a little bit and some of those infections then fall out from under that deed and it becomes managed on a state-by-state -state basis. And that's where we find ourselves at the moment with CGMV. Each state is responsible for managing detections in their own jurisdiction. And then broadly, we are working together nationally to try and keep that coordinated approach. The other thing we do is testing, lots and lots of testing for seed and for symptomatic samples that come through the lab. So I'm actually going to hand over to Andrew Daly at the moment, who is the leader of our Plant Health Diagnostic Service in Sydney, and he's going to cover a little bit more detail on the laboratory side of things. Thank you, Shannon. Okay, I'll quickly just run through the essential details regarding testing requirements and the diagnostic processes for CGMV here in our lab. So I'm sure everyone's aware that if you want to import cucurbit seeds into Australia, then having a portion of them tested for CGMB as well as some other viruses at the Department of Ag accredited labs is essential. Um, testing can either be pre or post border arrival, and you should be able to find a list of these accredited labs on the Department of Ag by web webpage. If you opt to have testing in Australia, then the required amount, which is 20%, up to a maximum of 9,400 seeds from each lot, is sent by the Department of Aid with the biosecurity direction by the Australia Lab here at EMAI or the other laboratory at AgriBio in Victoria. Now, the seeds are tested by a method known as ELISA, and the detection limit with that test is one in 100 seeds, which means when we receive the seeds, they need to be split up into 100 seed subsamples before they're tested. Um, so therefore, if we receive 1,000 seeds, um, that will take 10 individual tests to complete the job. 
with regards to other types of testing, if you suspect CGMMV in a crop, or if you're aiming for a pest-free place of production and need testing for export purposes, then plant material can be tested in the lab as well by PCR or ELISA. But PCR methods are much more sensitive in the case of plant material. There's also a kit that uses test strips specific for CGMMV, um, which is commercially available and can be very handy for on-farm screening. However, it is less sensitive than lab methods and it is generally more prone to inconclusive results. So finally, although CGMV has been detected on a few locations in, in New South Wales, as you've heard already, every measure has been taken to contain it at no one's sites and it's still a notifiable plant test. So any suspect positive or any suspect or positive detection will need, need to be communicated to the Chief Plant Protection Officer of New South Wales. So that's in a nutshell as far as testing goes. If you'd like any further details, keep the questions coming in and we'll endeavour to answer as many as possible. Thank you, back to you, Shannon. Thanks, Andrew. I'll come back to testing in a moment in terms of how to get samples tested. But I just wanted to go back through the current situation that we find ourselves in New South Wales at the moment. As Andrew mentioned, we've had detections on four properties and we're working with those growers to maximise containment efforts and also understand the introduction pathways into New South Wales, because that's important to understand how it's getting here in the first place. But to manage this particular situation in New South Wales, uh, there's a few confounding factors that make it a little bit more difficult. Uh, the symptoms can be easily confused with other viruses. So there might be growers who have persistent viral infections every summer, which many growers do, particularly in the Sydney Basin. They may be assuming that it is just another one of the real virus. Uh, the only recommendation I can have to that is if you have any virus issues to get it tested to be sure you know what it is. There's also a fairly large uh, non-English speaking background in, in the Sydney Basin. So I think what we may need to do for this particular effort is get uh, some of the information and fact sheets translated into different languages so that we can make sure that all growers have access to this information. Um, if you feel that you have a community group network grower market that might benefit from this, um, please get in touch with me because we can then make sure that we're delivering it to a target audience in the most appropriate manner. Um, there are potential impacts on international market access associated with CGMMV. Whilst most cucurbit producers in Australia don't export their fruit, um, if they were to do so, they may face issues if they're trying to export to a country that is currently CGMMV free. Um, so it's most important to try and minimise the spread of this infection across the country as much as we possibly can so that we can protect those international market access routes. While CGMV is no longer considered exotic to Australia, it is still a notifiable disease. So if you have CGMV and it's been confirmed, or even if you just suspect that it could be, get in touch with us because we need to report that to the Chief Plant Protection Officer within 24 hours of suspecting it is. We can go through the diagnostic process and the confirmation later down the track, but we need to the necessary alerts in place straight away so that we can manage the situation as quickly and as effectively as possible. Uh, and the other issue we have with CGMMV, because it is so easily mechanically transmitted, there is a risk of um, a seasonal labour force moving between many different properties. And I would suggest that this also applies to many consultants that are moving between many different properties with susceptible crops, um, and to some extent, even the bees as well there is a risk that you may pick up this infection on your clothing, on your boots, on your gear, and then transmit that between farms. So there's, I'll come back to that in a moment as well. There are some strategies you can put in place to minimise that transmission risk, but it's something that we need to be acutely aware of. Um, hang on, what's that doing? Let's wait for this screen to, there we go. Okay. So, we have a couple of goals with this particular disease in New South Wales. First and foremost, we need to prevent the spread. Spread to new farms and spread to new production areas. That's the best way that we can protect industry is by not having the infection established on any property or any more properties. 
we need to reduce the impact on the properties that are already infected and that goes by way of advice and ongoing support for those growers so that we can manage those infections and minimise the risk of spread of those farms as well. And in doing so, we can minimise the impact on our domestic trade but also on our international trade pathways as well. Wrong way. Just to also make you aware, there are some legislative responsibilities that we all must follow in New South Wales, uh, and that falls under the Biosecurity Act 2015. And this regulates uh, anything to do with CGMMV, particularly for the carrier material. The carrier material is any material that can harbour the CGMMV virus. This includes plant material and soils and even equipment. There's a few things that you cannot bring into New South Wales, and this is part of our risk management strategy. Obviously, anything infected with CGMMV. If you go to another farm in another state and they are having an issue with CGMMV, you cannot bring back any of the fruit, any of the plant material, any of the seeds from that property. You cannot bring into New South Wales cucurbit plants or seeds unless they were grown in an area that does not have CGMMV, and this must have a proof of freedom certificate attached to it so that there's proof that it's not there, not just that it has gone undiagnosed because there hasn't been testing done on it. And you also cannot bring soil into New South Wales that's been in contact with cucurbit plants unless it's sourced from an area free of CGMMV and that area must be certified as well. What you can bring into New South Wales are cucurbit fruit and this allows growers to continue to trade on the domestic market. The reason for this is Generally, the fruit that is the worst impacted by CGMMV is unmarketable anyway, so it doesn't make it into the supply chain and leave the farm as it is. There is a very, very, very small risk that you would have marketable fruit that has CGMMV infection. However, it tends to be a one-way path where it goes from farm to market to supermarket to consumers in their home. It tends not to go full circle back to a farm where it could risk introducing it. But it is certainly something to be aware of if you have staff on your property who like to bring cucurbit material for lunch. Be mindful of what they're doing with that material once they're finished eating. You can also bring into New South Wales clean equipment and coverings for regular farming operations. However, it must be from a certified CGMMV free area. Uh, and this regulation applies to equipment only within the last five years. I haven't met a grower yet who doesn't inspect their crop religiously and fanatically and know everything about their crop that they can. But I would still urge people to regularly inspect their crops and record the observations that they're making. If you are looking for virus symptoms in particular, look over the entire plant because you might find that the symptoms are very subtle or there is only a couple of plants showing symptoms, or the symptoms are restricted to a very particular part of the plant. Sometimes the symptoms are very subtle and not terribly obvious. So looking through the, the whole plant is important. And continue to inspect throughout the growing season because this particular infection can come and go with their symptoms. Um, so if you do notice anything odd, the best way to report that and to seek more help and advice would be to report to the Exotic Plant Pest Hotline on 1800 084 881. This will put you in touch with a representative from New South Wales DPI and they will advise you as to what to do next. If you genuinely suspect that you have a CGMV infection in their property, you, they will actually provide you the necessary advice as to how to get a sample to our laboratory for testing and they'll also flag it with our biosecurity team. So you can get a, a phone call from one of us and it's a more health and advice. Uh, the most important thing is to try and rule out is it CGMV or not? And even if it's not CGMV, is it something else that we still need to manage anyway? I think the coffee's wearing off on the presentation. It's taking slower and slower to move the slides across. Okay, if you do suspect CGMV, once you've rung the hotline, the next step is to actually get a sample into the laboratory for testing. There is a specimen advice form that you send to the lab, which you can see a little part of it on the screen there. That's available to download from our website. And this also applies to any other infection that you need to get diagnosed, same process. But for CGMMV, if you can, try and wear disposable gloves when handling the suspect plants. The reason 
option for that is you only need to get a small amount of infected sample on your fingers and then you can transmit that to all of your other samples that you're collecting. So particularly if you're sampling from multiple houses or multiple blocks for field crops, you want to know which house or which block is infected, if it's infected. You don't want to end up with false positives across all five blocks that you've sampled because you've touched every single plant. Um, if you don't have disposable gloves, a quick cheat option too is to actually pull the Ziploc bag over your hand, grab the plant with your hand inside the bag and then pull the bag back over it. And at least then you've got the plant sample contained within the bag and you haven't physically touched it. Uh, a simple Ziploc sandwich bag is all you need. It doesn't need to be anything fancy, but it does help to pop a bit of uh, moist paper towel in the bag and seal it up well. And try and keep it as flat as possible. Um, particularly with cucumber leaves, uh, but also with most of the cucurbits, they do degrade very, very quickly. So having that moist paper towel in them helps preserve them as long as possible until we get them into the lab. When you get the submission form, please complete it with as much detail as you possibly can. Contact details are obviously essential because we need to get into touch with you to give you your results. But the more information you can give us as to how widespread it is, what variety you're growing, what species you're trying to get assessed, that helps us with our jumping off platform as to what we test for first and how we go about the testing. If you suspect it could be CGMMV, make that very plain on the advice form uh, because that helps us with our um, quarantine procedures within the lab as well. If you are not sure if it's that or if it's something else, that's fine. That's our job to figure that out. So the more information you can give us, particularly on the symptoms, write down as much detail on the symptoms as you possibly can. What we find is it can take hours, if not days, for samples to get to us in the lab. And once it's been sitting in a hot Ziploc bag for that a period of time, this, the, the leaf tissue starts to break down. The more detail we have for when it's fresh or even a photo, anything like that is brilliant because often by the time we get it, the symptoms aren't as obvious as they were a few days ago. So as much information on that form as you can really helps us out as part of the diagnostic process. If you are using uh, tools, or also just even bare hands to collect the samples, sanitise in between the samples so we don't spread the infection amongst all of your sample batches and then you end up with false positive results. Uh, there are couriers attached to the diagnostic process with our PhDS lab, but if you end up putting it in the post, please don't post it on a Thursday or Friday. It will end up sitting in a malprocessing facility in Sydney over the weekend, and it will take a lot longer for it to get to us, which means we get the sample in a much poorer condition. Uh, so the best time of day or the best time of the week to post is Mondays and Tuesdays. That gives us enough time during the week for the sample to get to us as fresh as possible. Uh, and that's ideal for processing. <clears throat> okay, so you have the suspicion that you have something going on in your crop. You're not quite sure what. So you've sent the sample off for testing. What do we do next? The best process is to isolate the block that you suspect has infection in it and make sure that you include a buffer zone because there's quite likely plants either side of the symptomatic plants that may be infected but not showing symptoms yet. Also make sure that all the staff on your site are aware of what's going on and aware of the restrictions and try and minimise any contact with that part of the crop until you know the results. Basically treat it as contaminated until you know that it's not. If you end up with a negative result for CGMV, that's fantastic. You can go back to business as usual. If you end up with a negative result for CGMV but a positive for something else, then we can manage that infection because we know what it is now. If, unfortunately, you end up with a positive result for CGMV, one of the best options is to destroy the plants within your isolation zone. Now, this is not a legislative must. This is scientific advice based on trying to reduce the amount of virus you have on your site. If you continue to grow a crop right through to the end of its normal life cycle when it's full of CGMMV, all you're going to do is increase the amount of virus on your property and increase the potential contact with that virus and that increases the risk of spreading it around. The best way to dispose of plant material is by burning or burying it. Uh, but Bear in mind where you're actually going to bury the material. You don't necessarily want to bury it in the middle of your production area and then go straight back to cropping. Because if it is CGMMV, remember it can persist in the soil for some time. Make sure that you include any crop waste and deleafing material in that process because it's important that all of the material that's come in contact 
with any of those infected plants is treated in the same way. Make sure that you sanitise any equipment that you're using on that particular affected area. Washing it is not enough to kill the virus. It will help in the process, but it will not kill the virus. And make sure you restrict access to the farm for visitors and contractors. Now, we recognise that farming is a business and you will need contractors coming to site, but you really need to give consideration as to who needs to be there, how they need to be there and where they need to go and deploy the appropriate biosecurity measures there. The CGMV, it is a notifiable disease. You must alert New South Wales DPI if you suspect that you have it or if in fact you do have it on your property. There is no penalty for finding it, but you do have a biosecurity duty to contain its spread. The goal for CGMV infection in an active farming situation is to reduce the inoculum as much as possible and as quickly as possible. And we can achieve this two ways through crop management. The obvious thing is to remove old crops as soon as production has finished and obviously to remove infected crops as soon as practical and look at spelling the infected areas. Now, whether this is just an actual empty block or an empty house for a period of time, or you actually switch out to a non-host crop for a while, that helps to reduce the amount of viable virus left behind. And if you can leave it long enough, that would be ideal because then you can basically outlast the virus on the site. Weed management is also really important. Removing any cucurbit volunteers that pop up during the, uh, during the year uh, is essential, not just for CGMV, but for all viruses. Uh, but also target the weed host that can host CGMMV. The main goal for this particular infection is preventing spread, and that's preventing spread across your property, but also between other properties. So as I said, restricting visitors and access to contractors on the site is important. Um, make sure if you have a biosecurity plan on your farm that they are aware of it and that they follow it. And if you don't have a biosecurity plan on site, I highly recommend getting one in place as soon as practical. There are free options that you can download off the internet. And I believe Melon Australia has already put together a CGMV specific one. Now this is targeted towards melons, but it's easily adaptable for all cucurbit crops. Uh, you need to be mindful of what's coming in contact with infected plants because that's where your transmission risk lies. So you want to look at things like parking bays so that you can isolate on-farm and off-farm vehicles. You might have uh, foot baths, you might have quarantine areas for new stock or new equipment or new things that are coming onto the property. You want to have the ability to quarantine infected tunnels or crops and make sure that the staff on site are aware of that. Make sure that you use seed from a reputable source. Don't trade seed amongst yourselves because it could come with a hidden infection that you just don't know that it's there. Make sure you also clean and sanitise tools and equipment between crops and most importantly, before leaving in site. If you're recycling any materials on site, like packing crates, once they come back to farm, make sure that they're washed and disinfected before you go again. Uh, and also make sure that your staff and yourself are aware of what to look out for show them the symptoms on the slides, have a look at some of the other material that's online and get familiar with what to look for and make sure you discuss the best way to report that amongst your own business and then you can also go through to reporting for New South Wales DPI. On the disinfection cycle, um, first and foremost, not all disinfectants are equal. Antibacterial does not equal antiviral. There are a number of good disinfectants out there that are great for bacterial infections and even for fungal infections, but they just do not work against viruses. So make sure when you are selecting a disinfectant that it is CGMMV approved. <clears throat> when you are cleaning down particularly equipment, make sure you actually wash it down first. If you're trying to expect a thin layer of disinfectant to penetrate through multiple layers of dirt and grime and plant material to get to the surface that you're trying to disinfect, it's just not gonna work properly. You really need to have the equipment as clean as possible and then apply the disinfectant because that's when you have the best chance of actually achieving disinfection. You need to remember that viruses are extremely tiny creatures. We can pick up bacterial and fungal infections on crops. We can pop them under a microscope and we can see them quite easily. We can grow them. Viruses are not so straightforward and they are much, much smaller. If you want to look at a virus, you actually have to go to an electron microscope and even then they're still really super tiny. 
So if you start thinking on that sort of microscopic scale as to how many places one virus particle can hide on a shovel, on your boots, on a tractor, we need to minimise any chance where it might be able to reside under a layer of crud and dirt. So starting with clean implements is the best option and then disinfecting on top of that as well. Make sure that once you apply the disinfection that it actually stays on there for as long as the label recommends. If you're just dunking tools in and out in a second, it simply might not have enough time to work. And if you're going to go to the effort of mixing up chemical, buying chemical in the first place and then using it, you want to make sure you're using it appropriately so that it does actually work. There are a few different disinfectants recommended for CGMV and they include Vercon, bleach and even non-fat milk powder. But make sure that you make up fresh batches on a very regular basis. The active ingredients in many of these disinfectants, uh, they break down in nature very quickly. So you don't want to have a big batch that you make up for six months worth of supply. You're far better off making up a small batch daily or at least weekly so that you make sure that the disinfectant you're actually applying is as active as it possibly can be. Uh, now, also, once it gets dirty, make sure that you replace it because it's, it's not going to work very well if it's trying to fight against all the dirt and grime in the bucket. Some of those disinfectants are corrosive on metal. So what you can do is wash the implement down, disinfect it for the recommended length of time, and then you can actually hose off that disinfectant so that it's had enough time to work, but it's not actually going to then corrode the metal. I've had a few questions about how do we go about replanting once an infection is detected on site. It's not an easy answer. Um, because it depends on how quickly you want to try and eradicate the virus off your site, if indeed it is possible to eradicate or minimise the inoculum levels on your site. You are allowed to replant, but you do so at your own risk. If you have an infected crop, particularly a field grown crop that you pull out and then replant straight away, there is a fairly high risk that those plants will contract the infection. If you spell your property for a period of time, you might be able to go back and test it and see how it goes. And this might be through planting a small block or you try planting sentinel plants where you actually collect soil from different parts of the affected block, grow some sort of cucurbit plant in that soil and, and see what happens. But it's a bit of a numbers game. You might have an entire field that you are trying to manage infection in and you might collect soil from 100 different places and none of those plants get infection doesn't necessarily mean that the field's clean, it just means that those hundred spots that you sampled were clean. So it is very difficult to prove that the CGMV is absent um, and it's probably going to be a bit of a trial and error process as well. You can also try rotating just to a non-host crop um, and these include uh, capsicum, snake bean, sweet corn, okra, sorghum and peanuts. So if that is an option, that would be certainly a good recommendation. There's a few different places you can go to get some more information if you're interested. Um, DPR website has a fact sheet and they will also be hosting this webinar on that website as well shortly. Ooh, just had the lights turned out of you. <laughs> um, there's the National CGMV Management Plan that is also available online. There are various farm biosecurity plans that have been developed and there are CGMV specific ones that have been developed as well. If you don't have a biosecurity plan for your farm yet, get one. If you do already have one, now is a perfect time to review it and make sure that you've got as many practices in place to try and reduce the risk of transmission. And it doesn't just apply to this particular infection, but also to other infections as well. There's also the melon industry, there's Ausveg, there's local land services, and there's New South Wales DPI that you can reach out to for support and advice. The exotic plant pest hotline is 1800 084 881. And of course, you can always send samples into our plant health diagnostic service at EMAI. But I really just wanted to finish by saying this is not the best infection to be dealing with with the cucurbit industry in Australia, and certainly not for New South Wales. But the best way that we can get the minimal impact on industry is by all working together. If you have further questions that we can't answer today, um, by all means get in touch with me here at our Arimba office, uh, and that's spelled, uh, spelled O-U-R-I-M-B-A-H. Um, I'm more than happy to help. I'll be working on a uh, particular cucurbit virus project for the next couple of years. Uh, so even if it's not CGMV related but you do have virus issues, uh, I'd implore you to get in touch with me if you haven't already. 
one of the biggest things that we can achieve for industry right across the state is by understanding exactly what pathogens we have, where we have them and what particular commodities they're affecting. That information will then feed into a broader area-wide management plan for cucurbit viruses in general. And the more growers I can meet with, the better. I can also undertake surveillance on your properties. Um, we're just working through the fine details of how to do that in the midst of COVID, um, but we have some good strategies in place there as well for the moment. But we can undertake the surveillance, we can give you advice, and we can provide the diagnostics all covered under the project. So if you do have recurrent virus issues, or even if you just have a sporadic issue um, that you're not quite sure about what's happening, please get in touch with me uh, because it'd be really great to meet with as many growers as we can right across New South Wales. But for the time being, I'll hand back to Leonie. Thank you again for joining us today, and we'll see if we can get through some of your questions. Hi, thanks Shannon and Andrew for that great presentation. You certainly covered off on a wide range of important information, and there's a lot of information for people to be thinking about out there. So thank you. We've had a number of questions come in, so we'll just um, endeavour to get through those. Um, so the first question, and they're not in any order, sorry guys, so they're just going to have to come at you. So how do I use the milk owner? Uh, yeah. So how the do I use the milk the powder day. as a disinfectant? Do I scatter the powder on the equipment or do I make it up as a liquid? Look, my understanding is you make it up as a liquid, but the easiest solution to that is why don't I see if I can find the protocol and we can pop it up on the website with this webinar. Yeah, okay, no, that's fine. Yep. Um, so what we've discussed about disinfecting equipment. So what is the best way to disinfect clothing that has been near an infected prop, please? Uh, the current advice that we've received for CGMV is to launder the clothes as normal. Once it's put through uh, particularly a hot wash with detergent, um, that should cover off most things. If you are working particularly within a greenhouse where you have plants at height around you and you are working in a severely infected crop, the other option I would suggest is um, try disposable overalls. At least you can peel them off at the door of the greenhouse and that minimises contact with any clothing as well as even in your hair and your skin as well. Um, that's certainly something that we use when we're on farm and that works really well. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, Andrew, people are just wondering how many samples they be sending in for testing if they come across something suspicious in them. Yeah. So how many samples as in plant samples? Yeah, just how many samples should they submit ideally? Ideally, um, look, it's it's really um, a, a case of just picking the, the best examples if you have a suspect infection. So um, whatever has the, the most severe symptoms um, or recognisable symptoms and probably just a, a bit of a representative um, number across a paddock or across your farm. Um, perhaps, you know, if you're just looking at a very localised infection, pick samples from three plants um, and include those that you're particularly worried about especially. Um, because the virus, when, when we do the testing, we really need to... Um, the best chance of getting a confirmed detection is to test symptomatic sample. So anything that looks like virus, um, send that in and just a representative sample. There's no magic number really. No, that's okay, thank you. Um, when can we buy the field testing kits for CGMMB please? So they're actually supplied by an American company called Axia and we can order them through the Tasmanian Department of Primary Industries, through TASAG. So that's actually how we order our kits, directly through them. They're the national rep for that particular company. Um, so if you wanna jump on their website, their contact details are there. The, the tests, they're not cheap. Um, if you're trying to do this as a screening exercise, just remember that it is not as sensitive as the laboratory diagnostics that we use. And just because it's testing negative for CGMV on those strips, it could be that you have very early infections, so it's not strong enough to be detected by the strips. They're not as sensitive as the ones that we use in the lab. But also, if you do get a negative result for CGMV, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have another problem in the background, particularly if you do have symptomatic tissue. And at least if you have the sample sent through to us at the lab, if we hit a negative on one avenue, we have a few different things we can pull up our sleeve as well to, to try and figure out exactly what's causing those issues. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a charge for suspected notified with disease diagnosis? 
Uh, in this case, um, we're from the exotic suspect exotic. Um, New South Wales will pay for that. So the idea is that um, we don't want to be anybody to be deterred from sending samples in um, if there's an exotic pathogen lurking about. So um, it, it gets covered by New South Wales. No, great. And people are just wanting to know, can they actually sell our uh, affected fruit, please? Yes. There's no restriction on the sale of fruit domestically. Um, that, that's not a problem. It's not been restricted across the country. Uh, what we need to do is try and minimise the exposure to production zones and to farms directly, but you are still able to trade the fruit. The trade-off for that is your yield will be reduced by the presence of CGMV and as will the quality. So many of the fruit that might make it to being ripe won't actually be harvestable because it's just not high enough quality to be sold. God. Okay. Um, next question. If people have weeds around a crop that may have CGMMV, should they be sending those weeds in to be tested as well? If you have a reasonable expectation that the weeds are infected, you can definitely send in weeds for testing as well. Um, the difficulty is trying to find symptomatic weeds. Many of the weed hosts show no symptoms whatsoever. We We've certainly picked them up in our screening with the research project that I've been working on over the last couple of years, but many of the samples that I've tested positive for a range of different viruses have no symptoms whatsoever. If it's right next to an infected plant, you can definitely pop it in the bag and we can double check. Um, but again, it's a numbers game. You might collect 100 weed samples and you get one or two positive results. Out of it. So, Focusing on the crop is definitely the top priority. Um, but if you have a high suspicion that that weed has the infection as well, there's, you can definitely add it to the sample. Okay, thank you. Um, does CGMMV affect bees by any chance? Uh, in terms of bee health, no, we don't believe that it does. Um, and we think that it's just an accidental transmission as they're touching infected pollen and they might accidentally transmit it to the plant next door. Um, I know that that's something that the Northern Territory is working on at the moment. So um, I'm keen to wait and see how they go with their research and what they find. And then hopefully we can actually bring some more information to industry in the not too distant future on that one. Yeah. Okay. No, well, look, thank you very much. That concludes our question um, session for today. So that actually concludes the webinar for today. So thank you everyone for your time in joining us today. I hope you found it informative. So um, everyone have a great day and thank you very much for joining us. We hope you got something useful out of it. Thank you.